Okay, we'll get started uh, with our um, IS uh, distinguished lecture today. Um, well, Professor Steve Stambars um, has been our IS um, visiting professor, visiting fellow for a long time, and uh, but he hasn't been giving a talk lately. So I said, Steve, you got to come <laughs> talk about what's your latest and greatest. And uh, so he's um, here today and uh, telling us about the recent developments um, on the in-game game based laser dials. And that's uh, what they have uh, a lot of recent efforts on uh, for energy efficient sunset lighting. Lighting, now is uh, using laser dials for lighting and display. Uh, they're also working on both laser dials and the micro LEDs. And now Professor Steve Dembars, um received his uh, PhD degrees from my uh, University of Southern California. Um, I don't remember. You're young. Wow, 1988. Okay, okay. <laughs> in 1988, um, with uh, Professor um, Dan Dafkers, uh, one of the pioneers in MOCVD. Um, he worked at Hewitt Packer, who worked on um, LEDs for a uh, few years, and then he went to uh, University of California, uh, UC Santa Barbara, and has been there um, for many, many years, since the 90s. And 90s. Uh, 25 years. 25 years, okay. Um, so he's uh, been working on um, many at Santa Barbara. He started with this um, uh, 3.5, um, materials, and then uh, very quickly he's uh, switched over to the gallium nitride system and has been working on the, um, uh, one of the pioneers on the LEDs, and gallium nitride based LEDs, and recently laser dials. And Steve? Uh, it's always great to be back in Hong Kong, and especially got a very nice office today in the uh, new IAS building. Uh, even better than Kimmy's office, I was surprised that uh, they gave me such a nice office. But uh, so maybe I'll be coming back some more. But uh, I've been coming to Hong Kong, I guess, to HKUSD for about 10 years. More than that, more than that now? Before I wasn't a fellow. I forgot what you got, you called me, visiting faculty or something like that. <laughs> well, maybe 15 years. It's been a long time. Uh, but today I'm going to talk to you. Uh, not just about lasers, but also I decided to add in some stuff on the micro LEDs as well because HKUST is now getting a reputation around the world uh, as a leader in micro LEDs and kind of give you our thoughts on what we're doing on at Santa Barbara. And uh, so I'll be representing the work of a fairly large uh, group of uh, researchers and other faculty members in what's called the Solid State Lighting and Electronics Center, uh, also with Professor Speck and Professor Nakamura. So our group is... Uh, composed of over seven faculty members and over 50 engineers, postdocs, and PhD students. So we're one of the largest um, gallium nitride optoelectronic centers in the US. Um, and over uh, nine industrial member companies sponsor our research. Uh, and here's a picture of some of the people. I think Suji gave a lecture here just a few months ago, if I'm not mistaken. And then Kim has got to get Umesh and Jim here eventually to talk. Uh, but I've been working with these guys for over 20 years, and so uh, it's been a great pleasure and a big, great group of students. So initially I had prepared for a 40-minute talk, but then I saw she gave me an hour and a half. I'm not going to talk for a full hour and a half, but I did decide to add in uh, not only the laser diode work, but also the vertical cavity uh, work and to cover micro LEDs as well, so to give you guys a little bit more of a flavor. So I should be able to get through this in less than an hour, but nevertheless, uh, start out by discussing why we're looking at laser diodes for the next generation of what's called laser lighting. Um, particularly, uh, we've optimized a lot about the epitaxial laser diode design and optimized that performance. And then we've optimized the combination of lasers with novel phosphors, single crystal phosphors, that is, to get what's still the record in, in laser lighting of 87 lumens per watt, which is, while not as uh, efficient as LEDs yet, uh, is more than efficient enough for many applications involving displays, automotive headlighting in particular, and uh, other opportunities. And then I apologize to Patrick here, somehow the Li-Fi word got dropped here, but uh, we're also working a lot on laser Li-Fi. You should patent that trademark there. Life, laser life, uh, Anyways, um, 
then after LIFI, I actually spent quite a bit of time on LIFI. We have a fairly big group now, about four researchers working on LIFI. We'll talk about uh, vertical cavity surface emitting lasers in the blue recently for display applications. And then the, uh, the last part of my talk, I'll focus on our approach to making uh, discrete micro LED uh, for displays, not monolithic, but for transfer technology and, and the work we've done there, uh, particularly on pixel fabrication. Uh, and we're doing this work in collaboration with companies like Apple and Oculus in the US, which are trying to do a mass transfer approach to the micro uh, LED approach. So uh, first talk about the laser diodes. Um, so in particular, uh, laser diodes are, are going to start appearing in more and more of these applications. Already in China, there's quite a few laser cinemas, more than uh, 4,000 I heard, use a blue gallium nitride laser in combination with a phosphor for very large format uh, viewing displays. Um, that is one of the large emerging applications. And now in the US, there's about 40 theaters, and that will rapidly, I think, go to several thousand over the next few years. The advantage being uh, color, purity, but also brightness and uh, clarity and resolution of the uh, picture. So uh, gallium nitride lasers have already started to penetrate this market. Uh, more what I would call emerging applications are using uh, the vertical cavity surface imaging laser for straight projection display for AR and VR, uh, which we're working with companies like Microsoft on. As you know, Microsoft HoloLens uh, just last month came out with a laser-based system uh, for uh, some augmented reality applications. So there's a lot of discussion on what's going to be laser-based, what's going to be LED-based there. Then uh, uh, LiDAR uh, is another uh, active area we're looking at, not just for automotive headlighting, but actually putting in light distance and ranging function into the uh, forward lighting solutions to give you collision avoidance and uh, autonomous driving solutions. Uh, it, it seems like not a week goes by when there's not another autonomous driving company being funded by SoftBank or um, CIDIC or whatever. I think there's somewhere, somebody told me on the order, of 100 LiDAR startup companies right now uh, in the US. So it's a very, very hot area for trying to figure out how to solve the autonomous driving solution. And then, of course, uh, I'll be talking about Li-Fi networks, not with LEDs, but looking at where we can lasers can help out the Li-Fi networks in particular. Uh, so uh, like I said before, uh, lasers are already impacting uh, cinema displays. Uh, a lot of people believe that uh, TVs will also come to fruition. Uh, so there's uh, now a lot of discussion about laser for TV displays. Uh, BMW recently uh, released a new model of the car uh, that will start appearing in roads in the US this year, uh, later this year, maybe as, as early as December, and where we use laser for the, uh, the nighttime driving. And the, I wanted to go into this a little bit because people thought that this would take a little bit longer to appear in the US and that it was especially for the German market, but the, the main distance um, advantage you get for lasers is the, uh, the high beam function at night. So you could see, uh, this is from BMW, this is showing the LED low beam and high beam, and each marker here uh, is 100 meters. So you could see the LED high beam currently is not quite able to get out to 200 meters here. However, with the laser uh, diode uh, booster here, we can actually get to a 700 meter range, and that's been, demonstrated not only by BMW, but, but, but also by Audi. So this is a big deal if you live in a big country like the US or in Germany where they drive extremely fast because you know, when it's raining, the stopping distance at the normal driving speed of the German driver is 250 meters, so it's about right there. So what's that? What is the laser booster? The laser booster is the high, just the high beam. The laser booster is, they still leave on the other, LED functions, and the high beam here is still on, but then they turn on just the, each headlight has a, a laser high beam on it. So it's a separate unit, very small unit built into the uh, headlight itself. And so it boosts up, obviously, the signal from here, and it's very directional. Uh, you can even see here there's very little light spillage on either side of the road. And so that that is, a. Uh, so what, we've been working with a, a startup company in the US to help produce these uh, laser high beams for BMW in the future models. 
So again, uh, let's go into a little bit, why would we consider lasers for lighting? This is what I call the third generation of, of lighting technology. And fundamentally, the reason that you could start to consider lasers for this is the primarily the directional nature of the, the light beam that comes out, but also you can get away with, if instead of using 11 chips uh, of, of epi area, which would correspond to about 11 square millimeters of epi area, you can make a, a light bulb or a headlight with a single uh, LED chip that's only 0.3 millimeters of epi material. And so if you're gonna make a light bulb then, you would put uh, the laser uh, here and a phosphor chip here to generate the light source. So just thought I'd demonstrate this for you. The concept is pretty simple, uh, it's, but it's, it, it's remote in the sense that I take my laser beam and I hit a, uh, a single crystal phosphor to then convert it. So this light that's reflected then off this crystalline phosphor is safe for your eye. And so I'm only sh shining a five milliwatt laser on this. We make 3,000 milliwatts for the car headlight. So I, I can't show you that because you've got to have it all safety engineered, but nevertheless, the light emitted from this surface is then safe enough for laser light. So that's, that's the concept of laser light. And this one then shows you that the LED version, the efficiency drops very quickly, and actually you get to self-heating at around 300 amp per square centimeter, and you can't drive the LEDs any higher. Lasers show the opposite effect with droop. That is, they get more efficient after you hit lasing, and to the point that you get uh, efficiencies uh, in the EQE range above 55%, wall plug efficiencies are around 40% now. So that means you, that you take this current area advantage, you take the area advantage by just now using a single chip instead of having to use a bunch of chips that are running down here if you use LEDs. So that's the advantage of laser lighting. A lot of people ask me why would we switch to LEDs over laser. But because that source is so small now, you're actually able to focus that as a perfect point source for a directional mission. So I don't think lasers are gonna replace the room lighting here anytime soon, but they will start to be used in car headlights, projectors, and in things like cell phones uh, where you wanna project information. So here's one of those single uh, chips. This is one of the first versions we did uh, at, the, at the university where we basically go with a gallium nitride and the difference between a laser and an LED is that our lasers are edge emitting and we get confinement by etching a ridge here in the p-gallium nitride, putting silicon dioxide around it. And then instead of using metal directly on the p-gan, uh, we found it was necessary to use ITO here, a very thick ITO layer. And ITO being transparent is a much better waveguide material to confine the light here. And that was one of the key breakthroughs in getting to uh, high laser powers. So this one in particular is one of our first versions. We got 1.1 watt from a single laser facet, but um, we did some analysis of that. Uh, we use the ITO here is evaporated ITO. Uh, you, in particular, you want it to be very good quality. So uh, sputtered ITO just does not have the quality of the evaporated. This is very thick. This is uh, 2,000 angstroms. How do you evaporate ITO? Uh, E-beam. Oh, okay. E-beam. Yeah. So quick. E-beam. But, but no, it's a question. You could have done co-evaporative sputtering, but that's not as good. Uh, so but, but the throughput is going to be limited, right? It's going to be pretty Yeah, but I don't need as many chips. Remember I just showed you. I, I, I can, a single wafer, maybe to, to put it in context. So a single two-inch wafer will produce about uh, 100 light bulbs. Uh, if you're doing LEDs. With a single two inch wafer, I can produce 40,000 light bulbs. Uh, okay, so the other thing is we found out the loss was coming from the, the, uh, the facets. So if you uh, coat this the same material with an HR coating, in this case we're using um, tantalum pentoxide, silicon dioxide, we actually were able to get up to two watts uh, from a, a single subject. And this is important because um, two watts gives you enough power to actually make a 40 watt light bulb. So again, this is 0.3 millimeters of material. So I can get 40,000 light bulbs from a single two inch wafer. And Kimmy knows they have reactors that can grow 50,000 50, basically light bulbs a day is what we can do now from a single reactor. Okay, so how do we improve on that? So for the epi guys and the thing, one of the things we, we modeled is that the high optical loss was occurring. This shows the modal, this is the actual blue laser mode. The 
optical loss was coming from the P indium gallium nitride waveguide here and the P GAN. So what we did is we reoptimized it, lowered the doping here, and actually even lowered the silicon doping because there's a lot of loss there. And that's that's basically a trick that we learned from telecommunications industry is that the uh, free carrier loss, that is absorption of the free carriers in the N and P side, limits your lasers. So if we can continue to do that, these lasers will eventually be 80% efficient, which is what they are in gallium arsenide. If we get to 80% efficiency, these lasers will be as efficient as LEDs. Uh, so we've done that. What's that? Yeah, but there's a way to get around, as you know, in gallium arsenide, we can get around that by simply going to tunnel junctions. So we, we'll get there, but it's not going to be easy. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the voltage wasn't too bad of a hit. So this one, we went with a then undoped, undoped gallium nitride and uh, P wave guide. So this is then the, the green one here. So our voltage hit wasn't nearly as bad as you'd think it was. We only had about point, uh, point 0.1 volt voltage hit and yet you could see the power went from in the red here with the uh, basically the in-gan waveguide we basically went from one watt to uh, 1.8 watts just by changing the doping in that single layer uh, furthermore we, we've done some modeling on that and we've shown then that by undoping the p waveguide layer and doing what's called a remote electron locking layer which i don't have time to go into today we're able to get the loss now down to 4.6 inverse centimeters and injection efficiency is at 60%. Uh, you know, I'd like to see this number more like 80% and I'd like to see that more like one, one inverse centimeter, but still these are state of the art today in gallium nitride lasers. Still a long way to go in gallium nitride lasers compared to the more conventional gallium arsenide lasers. Steve, can, can the, the loss and the efficiency, don't you want the loss of the second sample and the efficiency of the you're exactly right. We would like this, this loss yeah. with that efficiency. Yeah, well, yeah, but the, yeah, the but problem yeah. is yeah. you can't get them both. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, so we have to do it through different ways of optimizing. It. We'll get there. But but you're right. Thank you. Yeah, you're not crazy. That's exactly what you want. Uh, all, all all research is crazy. Otherwise, you're not good. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, I just wanted to show you that uh, this then is that um, another version of the little phosphor chip I showed you, but in this case I'm hitting it with all three watts of power. And at three watts of power, this thing, even though I'm holding it with my fingers, uh, this is putting out a thousand lumens. Just to give you a comparison, your standard 60 watt light bulb only puts out 800. So basically this is a light bulb in my hand and it's 87 lumens per watt, which is to this date still the record for laser light. Uh, and it's six times better than that of incandescent lighting. So not yet at LED levels. LED levels are 150 lumens per watt. But the point is, it's so small compared to what you do in the LEDs that we can then use it for those other functions, like car headlights. Um, next part of my talk, I want to then talk about using that as a communication source. Um, so why would we want to go to using it as a communication source? Well. Uh, Patrick's here, so I'm sure you're, you're pretty familiar with some of his research on doing LED, uh, Li-Fi, which is modulating the, your house lights to communicate with your cell phone. Uh, this is from a company called Pure Li-Fi based in the UK, and actually Scotland. And uh, their main problem is that, uh, Harold Haas told me, is the data communication rate is not as high as they'd like it to be. You can do things like orthogonal frequency division multiplexing or wavelength division multiplexing to push it up. But at the end of the day, he's troubled by the emitter being too slow. So what, what we've looked at is uh, going to what they do in fiber optics, which is they use a laser for fiber optics. And we're doing this in a free space mode, so that's visible light communication. Um, so we, we'd like to do that initially. I think you might see this because we've already got it in the headlight. It's just for communication car to car. Uh, why would you want this car to communicate with this car? Uh, in the future, when we have autonomous driving, when this car slams on its brakes, the human driver takes about 200 milliseconds to respond. That's why you, you always follow a car at two car lengths. If you have a, a communication between the systems, this car could be two inches in back of that car. And uh, basically, you can, you can uh, then have much more safer distance braking. 
And, uh, you know, people say, well, that's already solved with uh, collision avoidance uh, systems. It is and it isn't. It turns out if this car actually senses an accident in front of it, it can communicate to this one. And so you just have safer driving. Uh, so most of the major car companies are now building in intelligent communication systems in their car using Wi-Fi networks, not using uh, and using radio frequency. But I think light-based, for the reasons we talked about, even having this might go to light-based, would, if you have line of sight, be a much better system uh, here. And then finally, believe it or not, underwater communications, we actually have funding to do this. The reason is there's no good technique right now to do underwater communications. If you've seen any of these movies with submarines or whatever, you'll notice all the submersible submarines or drones have big wires attached to them. And that's because radio waves aren't transmitted in the water. So they can't communicate with the ship up above. In fact, uh, the biggest problem when they were searching for the Malaysian air crash uh, a couple of years ago, they tried to put drones on it. Was, they, had, they could only communicate with their subs with ultrasonic. So as you know, ultrasonic frequency is very slow data communication, terrible mapping. Uh, and so what the laser life I get you is, is basically you can have one kilometer of free space communication in the ocean in the blue. And that's because the seawater is blue in the areas where you really need it uh, deeply. And so we can do very high speed communication in the underwater uh, environment. And so they wanna go out and map the whole sea again now with, uh, with laser life eyes. So we have a project with some companies that are now starting to do mapping and communication there. So very high data rates. So it's not a huge market, but I think it's kind of a neat market because it, it solves one of the problems. Okay, so this is some early work uh, about three years ago. Uh, so LEDs have sped up, lasers have sped up too, but it still shows you the, one of the main advantages of lasers over uh, LEDs is when you, uh, when you put the LED on uh, comparison to the laser, you could see, oops, you know, these with our lasers and LED systems, we were able to get uh, with a laser with a phosphor on it uh, over two gigabits per second of communication speed without even trying in a free space environment. LEDs, uh, early on were about 100 megahertz. I've seen them get out to now a gigahertz, but what they don't tell you is that's not in a light bulb configuration. I'd like to ask Patrick one question here is, I'd like to, what's the current speed of a, an LED light bulb? If you look at the analog bandwidth, without the yellow phosphorus, maybe about 10 megahertz, but with the phosphorus is about at best five megahertz. Okay. So if you do Nyquist, at the best is 10 megabit per second, but usually below that. Yeah. So it's, it's still, it's moved up a little bit, but not much. And, and so that's the advantage. Even with the phosphor on it, we didn't slow down that much. And, and so, More is yeah, and, and it's because we're small too. Yeah, the problem is when you go with small with micro LEDs, then you don't get the signal. But like I showed you, we were small and we're air doing three watts. So we, we gained it in two areas. So I'd like to work with Patrick on laser Li-Fi because I think there's a lot of opportunity here now. Um, to push this forward, and so we, we have, we pushed it forward in, in coming up with new laser designs where we shrink the uh, actual ridge width down. So this is one in which we shrink the ridge width down to 1.5 micron. That's the ridge width here, and what that's gonna give us, as you can see, is, is faster speed. So we've gone with longer cavities, but yet very narrow in the lateral dimension. Um, this one is then a semipolar laser, um, very complicated laser design. Uh, and then looking at communication with this, uh, we're able to push that speed now, uh, basically the bandwidth of this one at about 250 milliamps, we're able to push it, if you look here with the 3dB bandwidth, we're able to push it out to 6.8 gigahertz. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you leave the dial biased at that condition mm -hmm. for a prolonged period of time, say an hour or two, does this actually, uh, you know, due to self-heating that it actually degrades, or is, uh, do you have to have... You have a good... You know what? We haven't tested the speed as a function of time, but our lasers don't degrade uh, over 10,000 hours. But what I haven't checked... Do you see that we drive it? What's that? Do you drive it? Yeah, we drive it CW and, and thing. Uh, but he's got a good point. I've never driven them for many tens of hours at pulse conditions yet. Yeah, you've got to put PRVS in it and then you will be able to get the full spectrum as we know that's what you need. Okay. And the, uh, yeah, maybe I can collaborate with you on that and actually just send you some we should, go, we should go straight to PAM4, forget about NRZ. Yeah. That's what 5G is going to use. Okay. We should well, look at it. For, yeah, two bits per symbol. 
Yeah, we were just not set up. I mean, I did most of these experiments at the I house. I mentioned things you cannot do in SP, so yep. otherwise you won't work with me. I know, I've been begging. Okay. No, no, it's, it's literally we just... Here. We, we have Pemfo Bird here. That's, that's the one thing we yeah, have. I, yeah, and literally with us, it's, we're doing a lot of our things, chips, and we're not even doing them in packages, and, and it's better if I give you a package scan. But I, I have some, I can give you a package scan. Okay, well, what would be at high? Yeah. yeah, drop yeah. your cell phone. Nice. No, Okay, uh, and then, nevertheless, we can get very good differential gains now, uh, an order of magnitude higher than what you can buy commercially. Commercially, you can buy seaplane lasers. So basically what I'm telling you, by switching to semi-polar orientation, these cavity designs developed for high-speed communications, we will get to extremely high bandwidth. So this is measured in John Bauer's lab, what's called the standard on-off keen method. Uh, you can see then we're clearly uh, at five gigabit per second, uh, for these um, for these diodes, and this is still one of the highest data rates for a single 3,5 nitride uh, laser by Anoff Keen. Can you go back a couple slides? That, like, you have uh, the like front contacts uh, side by side. And, yes. Uh, why not uh, from the back? <laughs> Good question. Uh, basically, we get the lowest resistance contacts uh, when it's still lateral on the top. There is a, uh, even with C-plane GAN, there's some type of resistive layers in here when you grow the end GAN, so we haven't solved it yet. Okay. We get, this is still our lowest resistance styles. Uh, you, even if you buy commercial blue lasers from the chair, it's not front and back, it's side by side. But good eye, she caught that. Um, I just wanted to show you, so one of the questions is, uh, what's the intrinsic bandwidth? Because a lot of our bandwidth was limited by the photo detector, so uh, we've done some modeling then of the damping factor. Uh, and this is done in collaboration with John Bowers, who's an expert in telecommute. And he thinks our intrinsic bandwidth is basically 27 gigahertz. And typical, widely developed indium gallium arsenide phosphide lasers are in a similar range. They've got up to 40 gigahertz. So basically, uh, what I'm saying is, I think we'll get these things up to telecommunication speeds, and then we can start talking about terabit per second networks, uh, free space. And then, then it's you know, uh, all hands off, and then it's really then figuring out what's the application that needs this versus a Wi-Fi network. Uh, so then this kind of shows you the, the bandwidth track record of LED versus laser. Uh, so this is all the groups um, that were publishing as of like two years ago that we were comparing against. Um, basically, our record uh, LED was from actually University of New Mexico, which is my postdoc. He's at 1.2 gigahertz, and that's actually from some epi we gave him, and he faffed it, and he beat me. So, uh, at any rate, uh, the lasers were here, and now we're up here at 6.8. Uh, I think I, I need to update it a little bit because I heard uh, one of my collaborators at Kaus said he's now up at 10, 10 gigahertz, uh, but. I think it's just a matter of time for we're doing 20 and 30 gigahertz uh, here as we get to the, the right laser structures. Um, the other thing we've been asked to do is to, is to use this for a lighting system. And the problem with a blue laser and a lighting system is you don't get good quality light. So what we're gonna do for quality light is switch the wavelength to the violet to 400 nanometers. And we're gonna, instead of having a yellow and green phosphor, we're gonna have a red, green, blue phosphor here. And this will give us much higher light uh, quality, and uh, just show you what, what we're getting in terms of light quality. So these are the three phosphors we use for our, our laser light bulb. Uh, we use calcium uh, silicon nitride based one, and then for the blue we use what's called a BAM phosphor. This is what used to be used in the old CRT TVs, and then we have a um, basically a magnesium uh, silicon um, dioxide based phosphor. So mixing all these three together then, we get a blue, green, and red uh, with very high color rendering index. So we're able now to produce a laser light bulb, which has uh, right on the black body curve here. So 80% of what you get in sunlight and uh, very good color temperature. So this is uh, what you might want to use if you're actually going to try to make a, a laser light system. Uh, the other advantage of this system is we move the wavelength now of the laser to 400 nanometers and use the RGB mix here to give you the visible spectrum light. But since the laser diode is out of the main solar spectrum, we call this more of a solar blind Li-Fi. So we're doing tests and we think this will have better signal to noise ratios outdoors 
because there's less spectrum. And that was one of the problems we had with the blue lasers. Outdoors, it wasn't going as far as we thought it was. Uh, we might even want to push this a little farther. If we pushed it to 350, uh, there'd be very little light. Uh, and then we could probably still pump the same phosphor. So that, that's another potential use. So uh, let me just summarize the first half of my talk on the edge emitting lasers now with where are we with the laser light uh, today, uh, comparison to uh, LED light. So we're at 87 lumens per watt. And yes, uh, I realize LEDs are 80 all the way to up to 180 lumens per watt. I'd say the average uh, LED you buy in the store is still 100 lumens per watt. So we're not that far off, but the, we got about a factor of two to make up in the actual diode efficiency that is currently all limited by the blue laser chip I showed you. We're at 30, 40%. LEDs are at 80% efficiency. So we need to get that better. Um, droop ratio, though, is however where we really win. We're basically droop free, and LEDs start drooping drastically as you put more current into them. Uh, speed, uh, we're still quite a bit faster there with a lot of headroom. So the big disadvantage is cost. Laser light bulb costs a dollar. Uh, if you ask me today, what does a laser light bulb cost? Uh, well, I can tell you what it, what it costs for the car headlight. It's, it's well over $200 a headlight. So we've got to bring the cost down tremendously. Yeah, but it's, I remember when LED light bulbs were, were $150 for the very first uh, LED light bulbs about 2004. So about 15 years ago. So I don't think we'll have to wait 15 years, but I think we're off to wait about five to 10 years till this thing gets down into the dollar range. The main advantage is you can use these not only at fast, and what I, what I didn't show you is, is, is for the distance view, directionality. Yeah, so, so what, what needs distance? Uh, well, it turns out for stage lighting, they would love this. Any, so I think lasers lighting will only really be used for directional lighting for the next five to 10 years. Because you're right, you don't need it for, if you, if you don't need the directionality, you don't need the small size, it's too expensive and it's not as efficient. Okay, so I think that. Yeah. What about the current temperature? Why we cannot make it lower? Oh, so so uh, that was primarily. This is the uh, YAG phosphor, and you just missed this one. We have gotten color temperature on this one here, uh, at four thousand uh, Kelvin. So, like I said, it's just a matter of finding the right phosphor mix here, red, and we could have pushed this up to three thousand, but then the efficiency would drop even more. But that is more desirable color temperature. Yes, 2,700 Kelvin is what most we want. I mean, no, 2,700 Kelvin. It's up in Hong Kong. What do they, they like bluish white, right? They like the 400. Okay, 4,000. Well, then we can sell this today for $200. <laughs> yeah, who cares about it? <laughs> about the application, Steve, I just want to point out that if you build this, uh -huh. there will be new application. The reason is because people didn't use to put an incandescent light bulb on cell phone or shoes or luggage wheels. When LED was invented, it was put everywhere. You build a light bulb this small, mm -hmm. people's imagination will open up. That's I exactly guarantee right. you, I totally agree with you. The, the tracking, we were still just thinking about light. We got to think that it's beyond light. That's right. Definitely. You build this thing, you change the world. So that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> so, so, like, I, I to back at Santa, at Santa Barbara. You got a job opening or something? Oh, <laughs> shit, it's recorded. It's easier. <laughs> You're also going to come, come for sabbatical. Sounds good. Yeah. But, uh, but he's right. I, I wish I could have shared just a little bit more futuristic ones. We actually have a drone company putting this on. Why? Because they had an LED light bulb, which is big and heavy. And our, the size, I didn't emphasize enough, the size of the light bulb for the car headlight. If you guys remember anything about car headlighting, and, and I should have had this picture, car headlights at the turn of the century were this big because they used gas lamps. Then it went to an incandescent bulb, got this big. Now you had uh, halogen and the car headlights this big. With LED headlights, they're about three inches in diameter. The laser headlight is less than a centimeter in diameter. So it's size. So like you said, now maybe we'll put the laser on a microphone. OK. Um, then I got uh, one other area of lasers we're working on, which I thought was kind of interesting, is the vertical cavity surface emitting laser. This is another way you could solve the costs. Uh, so edge emitting lasers to date are still pretty expensive and didn't quite make it into your cell phone. What did make it into your cell phone is the vertical cavity surface emitting laser. The iPhone uh, 10 
uses, uh, and they show it here with visible light. This is not true. This is a infrared light, but this, this is the picture. They're imaging the, the camera with an infrared camera to show you this, so it's a real picture. And so uh, there's an array of pixels here. I showed you four by four. I just want to see if anybody's been reading up on this. Anybody know how many pixels there are in an iPhone 5? A 10. No, no. A thousand. A thousand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like freaking out. It's, it's by Lumetown. Yeah. It's 940 they, or 950. Yeah. See it? An array yes. of 30 by 30. There's a thousand pixels. The iPhone and then the subsequent Samsung phone are the largest users of lasers today. Are now with mobile phones. It is, if you do that count. Not... Are we being videotaped? We being okay, we won't talk about companies here. We'll just say company A has no problem making it. Company B is getting lots of orders and can't deliver all at the, the, I didn't say who company B was. And there's, oh, there's a third company. Company C is still struggling uh, because the volumes are so huge here. It's absolutely yeah. And now the, what's really surprising is they make those thousand pixels. It's only, it's less than $5. Yeah, so, so what I'm telling you is Vixels are a way we can also bring that cost curve down on the laser light. So, uh, and power's not bad. Power's about uh, 0.6 watts coming out of that. No, that's what's coming out of the, the phone. But, but it's pulse too, so. so average power is even lower. So that's just the, so just the sensor applications are huge. The other thing is display. This is a heads-up display in which they did a, a projection onto your car window. So, so displays and, and, and um, sensors are huge emerging applications for Vixels. So gallium nitride Vixels are even more in their infancy than the edge emitters. This is where we were in 2017. We only had pulse lasers. I couldn't even make a laser pointer with a Vixel uh, two years ago. I could do it today. Um, and what changed was we basically figured out that uh, a lot of the loss was coming from the aluminum implantation, uh, even though you need current confinement in a Vixel. So Vixel is very different structure than an edge emitter. In a Vixel, you put the mirror on each side of the cavity and the laser comes out normal to the surface. Uh, what we improved is in 2018, we got around uh, the implantation problem and we put in a buried tunnel junction here. So what does the buried tunnel junction give us is only have a little bit of P region right here. There's not any more loss, there's no thick P layer. You only get current flow right where this junction turns on. The current doesn't flow here because the voltage is too high. And so, this is our um, progress in tunnel junctions. First generation tunnel junctions. Uh, so this is the first tunnel junction used in gallium nitride. Um, lays pretty high current density, about 25. Is that by MBE? No, just all MOCVD. Even our tunnel junctions MOCVD now. They, she's got a good point. We couldn't make tunnel junctions with MOCVD until about two years ago. Before that, with Jim Speck, we, we had to all do MOCVD for the device and then MB for the tunnel junctions. Uh, that's another lecture for another day. But it took a while to solve the tunnel junction problem. So this one's the first one. This was only pulse lasing. Uh, you can see we're getting out nice spectrum here, so it's a real laser. Uh, what we improved in the second generation now with the buried tunnel junction devices is um, Basically, going to the higher doping, uh, we get now to 12 kiloamp per square centimeter. We got the loss down. However, you'll notice Vixels are still not very good, and that's because the loss is actually quite huge, 17 inverse centimeter. So this is still quite a bit higher than our edge emitting lasers. Gallium arsenide Vixels today are one inverse centimeter. When we get down to that range, then you'll start seeing some serious power. And efficiencies are much, much lower than edge emitting lasers. Uh, we're less than 1% on the overall efficiency and, and only 2.8% differential. Uh, so quite a ways to go. But I just want to show you that uh, just a few years ago, we didn't even have CW Vixels. Uh, basically, this shows you the life of one graduate student. He starts out here, 2013. He was with us a long time, five years. Basically, Suji Nakamura is a very motivator. He just told the student, you don't graduate till you have a continuous wave pixel. <laughs> yeah. It worked. <laughs> Look at this. Just pulse, 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 pulse. Yeah, he's got a job at Apple, of course. 
uh, anyways, so, so then he has a, a laser here, finally CW. So now we finally have CW, uh, which is red, continuous wave lasers now at around a milliwatt. Uh, so this is just going to continue and improve. We'll, we'll eventually get this up in the thousands, but it just shows you how hard your research career is. And by the way, it wasn't just him. We had about eight students working on it from here, uh, but it did help putting more students on it. So, uh, Steve, I'm sorry. That, so this need to get multiplied by a thousand to compare to the Lumentum one, or sorry? Yeah, so the Lumentum is only putting out about one milliwatt, of, I think. So we already have a, a one good enough for our sensor. It, well, of course, you have to make a thousand of these yeah. and make like millions of these yeah. in the module and all that. So we made a raise of six by six so six far. Six. Yeah. But our application is different. This is more for LIDAR. Well, that's a short range LIDAR for the yeah. face. But uh, what is the uniformity? Because you've got to measure the reflection and all that. Right? So, I mean, oh, our, our yield's very high on these now, uh, like 90%. It's better than our edge of mini lasers. It's, it's very good. It's very good. See, this is why Vixels are so much cheaper than an edge emitter. Uh, they're just so much, the yields are higher. Mm -hmm. Vixels are more like LEDs. You get 90% yields. Edge emitting lasers, you're down, you know, 40, 50% for a long time. And bigger, bigger areas. Uh, so that's the, the Vixel. Okay, last, uh, already 4 o'clock, 4.15. So last uh, 20 minutes or so of my talk, I'll talk about something that's of interest to uh, heavily here in HKUSC is display technology, in particular uh, the work of Kimmy Lau in micro LED displays. She's been doing micro LED displays uh, quite a bit longer than me. How many years have you been doing it for? 10 years, 15? 15 years she's been working on micro LED displays. Uh, this is probably one of the hottest areas of research now in the LED industry. Not only uh, the, the, the users, but even LED companies are switching divisions to work on this uh, with the hope and I do say hope it's going to impact certain displays. I don't know what form factor it's going to going to hit. Uh, it's going to be, I think, hard to displace OLEDs and watches. I'll agree to that. However, for some of these uh, see-through versions, near-eye displays, um, there's some advantages in that uh, you can get pixels. I mean, uh, these uh, micro LEDs down to a few lateral dimensions, few microns working. So there's a, a lot of question on to how are we going to get to RGB pixels? Uh, there's still a huge green gap. In fact, I'd predict there's even a red gap now. And so we've got to get the cost down too. The cost, by the way, of a micro LED TV uh, that Samsung showed at CES is over $100,000. Costs are going to be a problem here. So we've got a long way to go. Um, and I really think it's going to depend on, uh, again, the niche, you know, where do you want to, work at what what pixel dimension so um at my research group we're primarily interested in the near eye high resolution ultra high resolution so we're shooting for dimensions of around 10 micron uh even in the future going to smaller than than 10 microns down to a micron uh this is the range at which we could start to do some very interesting near eye displays uh and that's where a lot of our sponsor companies see it. they see a problem from about 40 microns to one microns Companies like Samsung are interested in larger viewing formats and they're interested in 50 microns or so. So depending on your application is, is what area you'd work in. So uh, the current train of thought is that we will use um, uh, indium gallium nitride for the blue and the green and then aluminum gallium indium phosphide for the uh, red. Uh, however, I wanted to show you this curve. So this is some data for, from our group here showing you that in the, uh, the green gap now, we're able to get uh, basically up to 30, 40% in the green region. Uh, but even in the red region, actually I didn't put the latest data point here, uh, for gallium nitride, we're at 1.5% at 620. So we actually basically took this curve and extended it to about right here. So the question is, uh, right now aluminum gallium indium phosphide is more efficient. But is it more efficient in the micropixel size? And that was the, what spurred some of the companies to ask us to look at this. The problem being that all the numbers reported for red out there are large dimension sizes on the order of 350 by 350 or bigger. As you make the red LED smaller, and you can see this here, this is some dense, uh, this is data, by the way, by, from LG. So this is some of the best red micropixel work. Uh, you can see as you get down into the 22 and 15 micron, 
their efficiencies are now down to 4%. 4 so I'm sure the OLED guys are happy. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. This is, this is not percent. This is a, okay. yeah. Yeah, he was really happy for a minute there. Uh, sorry. This is EQE uh, fractional. So multiply this by 100. Yeah, because I've checked this. So this is, but still, you should be happy because we're down to 4 to 5% in the red when we make a micropixel. And yeah, I've confirmed that. So we, we have a problem in the red. Uh, this is, again, this is from another group um, showing you the same effect that as you go smaller and smaller, uh, efficiencies really tank. This one, even at 32, they're, they're, and this, this number's right as well. Uh, so basically, uh, we think that it's, it's at least promising to look at looking at NGAN for the red portion of the micropixel. Uh, other people are doing quantum dots. Some people are doing down-converting phosphor. I'm not sure what's going to win here. Uh, our, our LEDs, uh, so we wanted to check this in the blue and the green range. Um, people were actually having problems in the blue region when we, uh, they started funding these. So we used a standard, pretty standard LED structure and just patterned it down. Uh, so our micro LEDs uh, look like this. I'll show you some data for various dimensions here where we use ITO now for the peak contact layer and then an omnidirectional reflector here for the side and then a lateral end contact. So this shows you the effect of shrinking down the LED dimension. This is 100 by 100 going to 10 by 10. Um, so you can see right around between 20 and 10, you start dropping in efficiency. Uh, however, uh, after working on that for a, a bit of time, we were able to recover most of the efficiency gain uh, in the ultra small blue. So this, um, this is uh, from David Wong's uh, thesis about a year and a half ago. Uh, so we didn't take too bad of an efficiency hit in the blue going from 100 to 10 microns. Uh, 42%, and this is the correct number, <laughs> so it's already multiplied by 100. So, so blue's pretty good. Uh, and the main trick to getting this was some work. Uh, did Matt Wong give a talk when he visited here? Okay, so it was mainly work recovering sidewall damage with the Tom McLair deposition. So he's published on that. That was our main uh, breakthrough to get good efficiencies in the blue. And uh, we modeled that along with uh, some other work, uh, but I wanted to highlight the other work by Oliver, which did point out, as you reduce the LED dimension from you know, hundreds of microns down below 10, the effective A coefficient, which is also called the Shockley-Reed-Hall uh, coefficient, shoots up dramatically. And uh, that is where you lose all your carriers is to the surface recombination in the sidewall. And so surface recombination losses become dominant uh, as you get down to 20 to 16 microns. So we're working on recovering that with ALD and other techniques. In the blue, not in the red. So we, we've, we've not recovered the red yet. And the green is, is uh, only 20%. Oh, because in the blue it's gallium nitride, and in the red it's gallium arsenide. And we found out, so the minority carrier diffusion length in gallium arsenide is much longer, so that it feels the surface much much further out. And so that is the big question now, I said in the micro display research, is everybody's worried about the red. Because we're not sure we can, yeah. As you saw, we're down two, two, three percent in the red. <laughs> He's happy. <laughs> I don't think you need to worry for a little while. Uh, however, I just want to show you, uh, this is one where we, we did a tunnel junction too. One of the problems we were experiencing in our, in our uh, oh, Jim Speck's not here to cover this, but uh, one of the problems is we were having a lot of non-uniform emission in our, tunnel, in our micro LEDs. We solved that by going to a tunnel junction contact on the top, and this one just shows you uh, standard um, LED was, we were solving, we were covering, the contact was covering up the light. And by using a tunnel junction, which is just N gallium nitride, and I, we were able to recover a lot of that efficiency uh, loss. Okay, uh, last part of my micro LED talk, then I'll talk about how we try to integrate all these. So we're not doing a monolithic approach. Um, most of the companies we're talking about are talking about big displays and or displays that they want to reassemble. And so for our mass transfer, um, you need to take then uh, basically a red wafer, a green wafer, and a blue laser, blue wafer, and then assemble them all onto host substrates by stamping or mass transfer. Um, so you need a lot of things. So this is a big problem right now in the industry is how to solve these, these problems. Um, 
so a lot of these these problems of scale uh, 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 of scalability, the predominant way uh, that people are going to take these basically micro LEDs off is um, by laser liftoff. So I'd say the majority of the industry uses this technique. So serial process, you basically step through this, hit it with a, uh, a laser, which hits a backside of a absorbing layer here beside every LED, and you lift off the LEDs this way. You may laugh, but this is the way that uh, the major micro LEDs companies are making arrays of micro LEDs now. They're doing laser liftoff. This works down to about 40 microns. As you can imagine, below 40 microns are having problems with this. Not only yield, but damage, and just they're having problems, you know, just lifting off one micron because at that dimension, the heat from the laser is talking with the next pixel. Uh, so we've developed a, what I call a more elegant solution and a lot less damaging. That stands for PEC. This is photoelectrochemical etching. In that layer, we just put a sacrificial layer here and we just etch it from the side and then we're left with freestanding little micropixels. And so this is the approach that we're taking. Uh, these then could be put down by stamping. Uh, we've also put them in solution and in inkjet printed them. And uh, I'll just show you it works. So uh, these are the what I'd call the leading companies in the U.S. then on this transfer and assembly approach. Um, just kind of point out where they're at. Uh, so Apple apparently still is using a MEMS-based pick and place. Uh, we're more along the lines of what I call transfer printing, and this was pioneered initially by John Rogers at Northwestern. Uh, can be used with either PEC or laser liftoff, but I've heard recently they've gone now to PEC etching because it's less damaging. Uh, ViewReal is a Canadian company. Recently got uh, a lot of funding, I've heard, and in, in their technique, they're doing a solid printing uh, technique that gives a high yield. What's that? The regular cell phone has 8 million pixels. Yes. You have to pick and place 8 million pixels. <laughs> so, uh, that is a, that's what I said. This is a tough problem. Apple. Realistically, are you really people thinking about that? Apple bought this company, Luxview. Yeah, they bought it about 60 years ago. Yes. It hasn't produced anything yet. I've seen it. They produced it. As you can imagine, it has uh, a yield problem. <laughs> No, they're, they're serious. They're seriously think they, they can use MEMS to pick in place millions of LEDs. The, the MEMS pick it, it's electrostatic. They have MEMS, they have a MEMS pick in place uh, chip, if you read your patents at least, which can pick in place uh, up to 100,000 per stamp. Now, can that be done at 100%? Yeah, that is the, that's the. Steve, are you, are you advised to any of these companies? No. Are you working with any of these companies? Uh, Yes, 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 sort of, we'll just say. No, I'm not a consultant, though, so I'm not proposing anyone. To, so it's just, it's academic. I thought you, mentioned, you mentioned earlier that you don't mention company names. I'm just curious. That's I, yeah, I don't mention company names that, that may fund us. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> so these are out of the question, I see. Yeah, yeah, none of these companies fund us. Got you. Not relevant, I see. But they're, they're relevant and they're... <laughs> um, but you, you're right. How are you going to place a million pixels down? Eight million pixels. Actually, by the no, time they get to the is the current status. Yeah. 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 So we can do 16 million. So, so uh, just to point out, in all fairness, Samsung did make a TV with 14 million pixels. And yeah, that's the point. Yeah. TV. Yeah, it's a TV. It and Samsung and it wasn't, it was roughly 40 microns a, a pixel size is what was the lecture. So they probably did some repair method. So other people have said that uh, we're going to take care of this with... AI and laser and machine learning. Yeah, well, it, the problem not you hear is that your pixel size it goes smaller and smaller. That's yep. right. And then your efficiency goes lower right. and lower. It ain't going to work. And then uh, you're from 8 million to 16 million. It's not going to work. And exactly. then you're going to pick and place all that. It's not with 100% yield. Yeah. While the OLED can make it monolithically, yes. the attack time about the minute. Mm -hmm. uh, over well, I agree. I, I'm not saying this is going to replace the cell phone dis display anytime soon. Or, or the watch, yeah. <laughs> However, it's going to be a different display. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was an OLED screen, though, but it, it peeled off. I heard that the main problem was that whatever protective coating they put on it. I had a friend that had one. He, he pulled the – they didn't tell him, don't pull on the – he thought it was the tape or something. I don't know.
he pulled his screen apart. This is a, a tough problem. So that's why I said inkjet printing, you have a piece of paper where they printed 16 million. I have seen some printed screens that, that single color look pretty good. Yeah, printed LED. At one micron, you can print these fluidically. Printed might work. But then again, I've only seen single color printed. And you, nobody has a one or five micron green and red. The printed one was for a sign. It was for a sign. Yeah. 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 All right. So a lot of. A lot of questions. Uh, so we just did a, a mass transfer release. So we make the display monolithically and then it transferred and expanded. Like you said, uh, I will be honest and say our yield's only 95%. And you've got to be 100%, you've got to be probably part per, less than a part per million. You need to be 10 parts per billion. And we're not there yet. Nevertheless, a cute little lab demo here. Um, made the LEDs uh, right here, did the PEC etch, so we undercut them. And at least this allows for us to transfer the blue pretty easily. PEC etchings, liftoff is done in just 20 minutes. Just show you what PEC etching is again, for those who don't remember. Uh, PEC etching it selectively generates electron hole carriers in a selective liftoff layer, in this case, indium gallium nitride. And uh, that is then etched, uh, that P type gallium nitride with holes. And so you just etch the area where it's a, it absorbed by the uh, light. So we tune the light so that it's only absorbed by the in-gan in this case. And so in this case, we just basically etch uh, the sacrificial layer here. Let me show you this. So this just uh, shows you as time progresses. So in 45 minutes, this is uh, uh, one of the micro LEDs you could see. We could just come in from the side here and uh, etch away the sacrificial laser uh, layer here. And uh, it shows you as we etch it away. Oops, this didn't, this didn't quite show up. Uh, we're able to then go from a, a substrate like this to then single freestanding little uh, micropixels, basically uh, with the following process. So we then pattern them and uh, look at them on a scope. So on these particular ones, then we put the end contact off on the side and a, a common bus arrangement and then and if contacting these things isn't going to be easy either. If it's not monolithically, you know, people think contacting these things is going to be easy. And Kimmy Loud knows on the CMOS, it's, it's non-trivial. Contact all these things. So right now we, we do a, a basically a micropixel like this. The key innovation we had is we wanted these to lift off the substrate. We had to keep them on the substrate to the right point with little anchors. So we put little anchors here that holds it so you can pattern the whole thing so that you then take this thing and it uh, looks like this before a liftoff. So you have a basically end contact, P contact. So our little emitting area is here. And then we can just stamp that uh, basically on the thing. This shows you after the PEC etch. So we then etched it. So the etch is all the way under here. So the only emitting area is the, uh, the quantum wall region in the middle, that little blue region here. And then we take a PDF. What is the anchor? The anchor is it's still on the substrate. It's holding it in place. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, there's the anchor. The anchors are right here. So, so the picture at the top and the bottom, the SEM picture and the picture is actually 180, right? Because yes. the anchor is actually on the on the left down below here, but that one is on the right. Yeah. Yeah. Is it correct? Yeah, it's just 180. It's 180. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Then we take a stamp here. Uh, then we here's our substrate. Here's our stamp. We then place the PDMS stamp on there. Only takes a, a certain amount, fairly high pressure, and then just push down on the edge of the glass slide, and he's able to get about ninety percent yield with this process. He's got a little bit better. Oh, th this was thousand. So yeah, it was pretty small. Yeah, no, ten thousand is is a hundred by hundred. Yeah, yeah, huge number of things. Uh, no, it, it turned out on this wafer, what, the wafer, God, you got to have these things really flat. Uh, the wafer is a little bit bowed. Uh -huh, okay. It's got one meter of bowing, so that's uh -huh. really, you can't even see it. Yeah. 
it, that was enough that you didn't get perfect so lift off. The edge one or the second? Yeah, it's the edge. It's the edge. The edge didn't lift off all the way. Uh, so then, yeah. Yeah, here shows you the yield problem. <laughs> so did a nice little stamp. Look here. You're missing one here. So already, this is 80% yield. And you left some, some micro LEDs on the sapphire. So didn't get them all. I mean, this could be perfected a little bit more, but this is just for a, a transfer method. People think that they're going to come back with machine learning and repair those ones. I don't know. He's like he said, you got $8 million to do. So. <laughs> he gets you, get you the funding to do it, you know. AI assisted, AI inspired, you know. It's all good. That's right. <laughs> Uh, anyways, the, the one good thing about nitrides as opposed to the gallium arsenide, these are extremely robust. Lifetimes, no problem. Even at these dimensions, uh, no degradation. Uh, very robust IV characteristics here. Uh, this one just shows you, this is a single one. Brightness, no issue. So maybe application. These are micro displays are sunlight viewable. You know, you're right. For cell phone, maybe you never want to. But for the side of a car, I don't know, maybe heads up display, something where brightness is not an issue with micro displays in so the inorganic. Yeah, it's, it's going to be something tough. Uh, we've done very, very different ways. We've transferred it to glass. We've transferred it to, in this case, we decided to transfer it to acrylic. Um, so took our stamp and we put it down on this nice little acrylic thing, just showing you the flexible nature and bent it. So we got micro LEDs on here. Um, Kimmy Lau showed me a nice display, RGB. Uh, I don't know, how many pixels was that? Not very many. Not, not yet. It's a, just a few hundreds. A few hundred. Well, we did three. <laughs> <laughs> so we did. So we soon, a lot of time working, transferred the technology, transferred three uh, micro LEDs onto the same flexible substrate, and finally got it right here. So he's got basically RGB on one flexible display, uh, just, just to demonstrate the concept. So a long way to go, but nevertheless, these are all on the order. The, uh, this was nitride, so they, they, they were all on the order of 10 to 20 microns. This one you can see in room light. Uh, you know, he didn't, he didn't measure the lumens. Power was uh, in the 20 mi microwatt range. I, I, I didn't have, because you got to put it in the integrating sphere to do the lumen number. But these are single, this is three pixels. So, like I said, I know, because did you see how we're contacting them? We didn't wire bond. These are, these are 10 microns. Yeah, he dropped a probe station on this. This is not a probe station. How many samples did he drop? Pretty much the first time. He didn't work that hard on it. Yeah. So, uh, if you have a 10 micron by 10 micron chip, mm -hmm. that's your LED. What is the active area of the light emissions? Uh, so in, in the ones with the thing, it's it's roughly uh, one fourth of that. And why do you need to have uh, hundreds of amp per square centimeter of light uh, current to go through that? For the spray, that would burn it out. Because all that we use many amps mm -hmm. per square centimeter. Yeah. But we use up the whole area. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then if you use a quarter of your area, there's no way you can, there's no need to have... Oh, we're way overdriving you. We, we don't no, need no. it. But then your light brightness is not so bright. So your efficiency mm -hmm. must be so low. No, these are 40% these are efficient. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't make sense. Oh, no. uh, in this particular picture... I mean, if you are active area, mm -hmm. if you look, I look at your IV curve. Yeah. I mean, the curve, the, the... Let's go back. The current, <laughs> the current efficiency. Uh, yeah. The current curve, right? Yeah. So... All that is with driving the zero media. You're talking about M, we're talking about media amps yes. per meter. So, and then if a 10 micron by 10 micron, let's say our is the 100% fuel factors, mm -hmm. yours 25% fuel factors. Oh, no, 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 our fuel factor is going to be like much lower, 1%. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's right. So, because, oh, I, I know why. The, the reason is in inorganic, you need to space, the reason they want to go to small, they want to do a one micron micro LED then they want to space it by 100 microns because if you did a, uh, if you don't have that fail factor, the epi's way too expensive. It's crazy expensive. It's another problem, it's another problem we have. We have a lot of problems. <laughs> maybe, maybe, don't worry, you, you got job security. <laughs> 
No, no. I, I, like you said, we got to find applications. There's still no micro LED display you can go out there and buy. I mean, the reason Samsung pushed the micro LED for the wall display, because they know all these problems. <laughs> and there's no reason for them to get into it. Yeah, yeah they, they're not going for cell phones. The, and, and their wall display is sunlight viewable. And yeah, I mean, maybe that's the way to look at it. The only place you see LED displays really is football stadiums and train stations, out sunlight viewable. Because you could take advantage of, yeah, the current density. So you need the brightness. The other place I think uh, that's where I like what Kimmy Lau's doing is for the, the uh, augmented reality, where they want a lot of brightness either projected from the side of the eyeglass or on the thing, or a heads up display. So for projection, so right, right now, laser display, it's only projection, not direct viewable. Yeah, direct viewable, you're right. Yeah, you don't need these crazy current densities. Okay, uh, I think I was the last one. So last summary then is uh, basically uh, we proposed tunnel junctions. We got that working now in the, uh, the blue LEDs. However, what I didn't tell you is the efficiency of these red. The red's 1.5% and the green's about 20%. Uh, we've done a transferred approach, but uh, uh, this is just summarizing the, the micro LED work. There's a lot of work to do here before it penetrates a product. Okay, thank you. For your single crystal phosphor efficiency, is it comparable to the, like a powder-based, uh, uh, like uh, the phosphor powders mixed with like uh, silicones? Oh, very good. So if you put the phosphor in the silicone, uh, mm -hmm. you burn up the silicone. Yeah. But however, ceramic, uh, that is sintered uh, powdered uh, phosphors, are uh, actually uh, e even better than the single crystal. You only, I think, want to do the single crystal when we're doing transmissive base. Mm -hmm. There, because you have no, you don't have the scattering loss. So if it's reflective mode, I think uh, ceramic or powdered phosphorus are better, as long as there's no organic uh, binding material. Mm -hmm. So you you achieved 87 like lumen per watt efficiency for laser lighting, right? Yeah, that's ba based on a, a spotting size, spot size of 0.3 millimeter, something like that. So what's the uh, laser efficiency and what's the phosphor conversion effic efficiency? Uh, the laser efficiency was around 38%. Mm -hmm. uh, so the phosphor efficiency, so 87 lumen per watt is around 20% efficiency. So that means the conversion efficiency is, uh, wasn't that great, it was about 70%. 70%. But you gotta remember some of that soak shift. Okay. The phosphor itself, quantum efficiency is probably 90%. But the stoke shift, what I have about is uh, the, the loss from blue 450 to the yellow uh, photon. There's another, you know, th that efficiency is what we call a quantum deficit or stoke shift. Right. Yeah, that's why it dropped from, you know, 38% with the laser efficiency, but actual wall plug efficiency of the white is like 20, 25%. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question about the uh, life fi. So your laser plus the phosphor, uh, so what's the reason behind it? If you have a laser plus phosphor, your like, uh, uh, modulation bandwidth is uh, like, uh, smaller than the pure laser, blue laser? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. You, yeah, so I think there is still a deficit. You see it here, but since you're at higher speed, it's, uh, it's, I think basically uh, the laser light, it's because it's a little bit more spectrally pure, it's easier for the photo detector to lock in on that. The blue was pretty broadband, 450, and there's some uh, spectral overlap in the spectrum of the blue with the phosphor emission. Mm -hmm. Phosphor is extremely slow decay time on the order of uh, hundreds of nanoseconds. And then the LED decay time is on the order of 10 nanoseconds. The laser decay time is much, much faster. It's on the order of mm -hmm. uh, picoseconds. That's the main reason. It's just the laser has stimulated emission as a, a stimulated lifetime versus spontaneous. Mm -hmm. So your laser is not absorbed completely by the phosphor. What's that? Your moderation is because of the laser. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you, you can't lock in on the, uh, on the phosphor. <coughs> but the, I guess his question was why didn't the phosphor affect it as much as the, in the LED case? And I said it's, it's mainly just, if you look here, it's, it's just that this is so slow, uh, a lot of it just the speed difference here. Okay, so so for laser plus phosphor, if you only like lock the laser spectrum, 
You only care about laser spectrum. You don't care about the phosphor. Yeah, that's right. I'm right. Not locking in on the uh, phosphor. Stuff. So the, there's still a difference between the laser plus phosphor because uh, your LED, pure LED is still faster, right? Yeah, yeah, like I said, I was trying to explain it. I didn't do a very good job. I realized it's correct with the <coughs> spectrum. Oh, I don't show the spectrum. I do it at the very end. Hold on. Uh, it's because this, yeah, this is it. So in the LED, the blue LED lights down here, it's not very high, but in the laser case, you can see that signal to noise ratio is much higher. Right. That, that's the main reason. But it, after you get it a phosphor, so laser plus phosphor is slower than a pure laser. It, I oh, yeah, about that's just because, oh, that, oh, sorry, that's because yeah. the attenuation, the, the phosphor. Attenuation, okay, signal yeah, noise just ratio. just decreases the, the power that's coming okay. out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was just the power. Difference. If you would have normalized it for power, it's the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if he would have increased the, so yeah, once you put the phosphor on this peak drop down to here, that's all I'm saying. Okay, thank okay, you. Photo detector power. So uh, the third question about the uh, the micro LED. So if you go to smaller and smaller like uh, uh, size, is the reason um, why the efficiency is lower? Is part of reason is because of the like uh, extraction, because you have more and more like side emission. It's uh, two reasons. So. The dominant reason we thought was, initially we thought it was extraction or the contact area blocking it, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's more fundamental. It's the surface recombination. So the surface, the area gets, the effect of the surface gets more intense. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, at, at a surface you've broken the crystal. So you get deep level uh, state. And so the electron hole recombines at the surface, non-radiatively rather than in the quantum. So it's what's called so we call it surface recombination. Other people just call it defect recombination. Okay. So there's more surface area to uh, emitting area compared to a big LED with very little surface. That, okay. And it's and like I said, it's really bad in the red. It goes from 30% efficiency to two or three percent. Right. But the question uh, similar to the phosphor, if you have very like a small emitting size, you get like a light dispersion like you. You, you concentrated the laser spot to a smaller size, right? But your phosphor is like unconstrained. You, your light is uh, like uh, isotropically emitted from the phosphor like a uh, dope, dopant. So the spot size of the phosphor will be much bigger than your laser. How, how do you yeah, control that? that? That's the whole reason why you can't use phosphors in micro displays and mm -hmm. why you need to go to direct emission or quantum dots. Because mm -hmm. your phosphor particle is 15 microns. And if I'm making a 10 micron LED and you put a 15 micron phosphor particle on it, actually the conversion efficiency is not going to be good enough. You have to put a lot of 15 micron phosphor particle. So people can't use a direct, they can't use a blue LED with phosphors yet for a micro display. Uh, right. We come back to like a single crystal phosphor. Oh, that's, that's an interesting idea. Uh, so single crystal phosphor would work. We wouldn't have the side dispersion problem. But the problem is that swapping coefficients. But what efficiency? No, my question is if you have single phosphor, right? Single crystal phosphor, it's like a very big size. You showed us it has this size, right? Yeah. If, I, if, you, if you have a small, like a laser spot shining to that phosphor crystal. Yeah, it's going to spread too much. You're right. right. So a single crystal phosphor, it would be better than the regular phosphors, but you're still going to have a... a Let's say if you came in with a 10 micron micro LED, it's going to spread out to the whatever the Lumbertian distribution is. So it's going to it's going to become a 50 micron spot, at least. Does okay. That, yeah, but uh, but you did give me a good idea, which is we haven't looked at a single crystal version of the RGB solution yet. So in other words, just come in with a, you know different single crystals uh, to pick in place. It's still gonna be tough. <laughs> <laughs> and now we gotta pick a good place. To, so yeah. I'd like to ask you for your Wi-Fi, I mean light fire application using your laser, the, the UV lasers, mm -hmm. that you are you, you depend on the leakage of that for your uh, detection of yes. the, uh, that's why you get the gigahertz. So would you worry about the health kit health issues? No, because after it goes through the phosphor, uh, they're making like laser cinema now. You, uh, it's decoherent light coming out after you've reflected it out. But you still have the UV light though. Oh, the UV light. Okay, so the UV light doesn't become an issue until you get to uh, 380 No, nanometers. no, 400 is already bad enough. No, we've already done the studies on 400 nanometers. It's not, 
you know, because it's spread, you're not reaching the, it's like 20 milliwatts per square centimeter is the range at which you, you, they have the, the industrial standards on what's considered harmful for the 400. We're nowhere close to that. Yeah, yeah, but you're right. It does start to become a problem. They start, but it, it doesn't become regulated to like 399. But we looked at like 400, 405. Oh, you're, you're close. Oh, but, <laughs> but you know, you got a good point. It means I don't want to go below, much below 399. It, it goes up real quick. Now, at 360, what you're saying is right. There's probably enough leakage that you got to worry about the um, eye safety and some other things. Not not for the laser coherency, just for the yeah, for the general yeah general illumination concern. Uh, which may mean if I keep it at 50, it's much safer. But as we know, even blue light has the problem now of uh, blue light hazard keeping people awake at night. That, that's the, mm -hmm. in the whole lighting industry. I mean, they worry about the too much blue. And, uh, um, so I think if you're saying that you have a lot of the 400 uh, nanometer light, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether the industry would like to have it. Yeah, specifically for the, the Li-Fi. So if it's lighting, I can just filter this out. Yeah, for lighting, there's no problem. Yeah, I mean, yeah it's lighting, yeah. but for the Li-Fi, yeah, yeah it, it could be a problem. So for the Li-Fi, we might want to keep it at 450, not go to 405. That's a good, good point, why not? Uh, so first I want to say that uh, this question is not only for the lecture credit. So I want to know that for the proposed, uh, with this proposed laser, how about the uh, application for the like the transcutaneous applications with the uh, infrared light power? So like that uh, previously we want to try to use the infrared light power uh, with energy harvesting to charge the Battery and the skin, and but problem is that conventional LED, uh, we try that like over 10 centimeters the distance that the power efficiency arrived at uh, at the cell is not too high, so that means that the LED will. Uh, with a low efficiency, the LED heating problem will be because it's too close to your skin, it will burn your skin in the vivo experiment. And I want to know that how about this laser? So first is that with long distance, like over 20 centimeters, how about the efficiency uh, arrived at the skin and also the transcutaneous efficiency? It will, uh, that will be better than the conventional LED. It is in the sense that it's, if you make it directional, so uh, our colleagues have done it for a, a hundred meters, free space, this is just for the communication application. So there was enough uh, efficient light, and that's, but like I said, that's because you could direct it. And uh, so for a free space communication, it was good enough. The efficiency, if you defocus it and you send the laser light everywhere in this classroom, uh, yeah, that, that, that could be a problem. We've done it for uh, 10, 10 meters, but I haven't done anything beyond 10 meters. Uh, okay. And by the way, that with this proposed uh, um, uh, this laser, so its power efficiency is in principle is higher, much higher than the LED itself, right? Well, no, but power efficiency of, uh, of LEDs in the blue is higher than infrared, by the way. Yeah. So blue LEDs are now about 60% power efficiency. We're 38 percent. Yeah, because I see that uh, the at the infrared light uh, wavelengths like uh, around 715 nanometers. This wavelengths is not very high, right? Yeah, it's not very high. Okay, it's very so very low efficiency. Mm -hmm. in the, but in the blue, it, it is. Uh, yeah, Patrick. A quick question: uh, Was there any uh, comprehensive measurement about the laser light in the seawater? You mentioned about maybe about a kilometer. Yes. But was there like you know depends on how salty the water is, how polluted, and all that. Yes, yeah, depends. <laughs> on the, uh, so my colleague doing the, the doing those measurements is Boon Hoy. Oh, so Cass there were. There, yeah. So he, okay. He hasn't published all of his data yet. Uh huh. So uh, so I think he's near the Red Sea. He's in Jeddah. Wow. So, you know, you have 80, you have really good visibility in the Red Sea. Yeah, so if you go to, well, Santa Barbara also have very good, but yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe Clear Water Bay, yeah, so maybe the Victoria Harbor. You know, it you could know. be 10 meters in, in Clear Water Bay. I, I tell you that uh, I, I, the reason why I think that's relevant is because Google is starting to actually build data center in mm -hmm. underwater because the cooling, power saving. And if you oh. can imagine point to point high speed data, 
Now, of course, you can run fiber, but for ad hoc connectivity. Yeah, ad hoc, sure. Yes. Yeah, it really need. I think, like I said, need to we need to do in field measurements depending on it's yes. exactly it's depending on. Hey, you need water, water, water. We got it in China and Hong Kong. You know, come over here. We do some uh, scuba diving. Scuba water VLC. Yeah, VLLC okay. actually, okay. visible laser light. That's right. Thank you. Oh, you need to point that one. That one. I have a question for your mass transfer. Yeah. Have you, you would transfer them to the driver if you try to uh, uh, make a wheel display. Uh, have we done that yet? We haven't done that yet. It should be straightforward though because of, uh, let's just go here. I could have had both of these be, uh, these could have been N and P contacts. I mean, they are NMP, so I could just stamp yeah. that onto the drive. I, I could make it any spacing you want. So I can take it from the plastic stamp and then put it on your CMOS. It's just a pressure transfer. Uh. I mean, why wouldn't that be compatible with CMOS? Well, we like we do monolithically. Mm -hmm. We we uh, we use those uh, precision um, like fifty pounder. Uh huh. There's uh, there are alignments and uh, and also the pressure you gotta have the uniform. Mm -hmm. Every every pixel has the same like pressure. Oh okay, I see. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I agree. Monolithically, you know, probably at hundred percent yield. Uh, well, it's not every time. <laughs> uh, we, but like I said, we have transferred it from the stamp onto. Yeah, I mean, you could take once you've got them on the stamp here. There's the array of LEDs. We could have stamped that onto a CMOS, but like you said, it, it just depends how uniform. And the, yeah. So Accelerant, the other company doing it similar to this, has made uh, some pretty impressive displays with the good deal. But I, I think they've gone back and repaired the missing pixel. <laughs> they don't say that. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. I have a question about the uh, micro LEDs. Uh, I talked with some big expert in mainland China, and they all, for example, some uh, 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 some expert, they all think that the question about micro LED uh, in the uh, mass transferring is a uh, uh, is a more like uh, engineering problem instead of a scientific problem. So, what's your opinion about that? Way well, the problem is the engineering problem is so big because you need 10 part per billion and the LED industry right now is in the part per million range so that's why I'm looking at a scientific way to solve it I mean like ink jeopardying or, or other things so if they think it's an engineering problem I mean maybe that's apples brooks you're going to solve it with brute force uh, I, I still think if you have the right scientific solution to it you're going to Increase the yield. I mean, I mean, for our research work, is there any uh, suggestions from you for, yeah. for the research work? So, for instance, uh, we developed a PEC etch for micro LED because specifically laser liftoff was damaging uh, some of the chips, and they weren't getting good liftoff. So, that's uh, an engineering science approach to it. And like I said, uh, we're also looking at smaller than a micron micro LEDs. Uh, we <coughs> maybe sprayed them on. But you know, these are these are all things that uh, would be, I think, scientific solutions to solve it. It's a huge engineering problem. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to the tar 10 part per billion level we you need for micro LED displays. So, uh, what's your opinion on? You think? It, have you seen a, a full color micro LED display yet that you like? Beta be display. Yeah, betas. Have you seen good betas? The, the wall and sensor? Oh, the wall. So, so same thing I've seen. Yeah. yeah. That consumer electronic show, yeah. Oh. Hey, that's a good point. That's not micro LED. She's, she's, she's right. It's 50 micron, so we call that mini LED. Well, the definition moves well. Did it move up? It moved <laughs> yeah, from one right. I know most of the industry right now is centered around uh, 40 to 50 micron. Yeah. Yeah. They, they leave less and less space for micro LED, actually. Yeah, at the very first beginning, they think maybe 200 micrometer. Uh, uh, below that is micro LED, and then to 100 micrometer, and then 80, and then 50. <laughs> they leave less space for micro LED, and they leave more space for mini. Mm -hmm. So, who's going to assuming that you can have 100% yield, um, you have another issues, which we had to deal with in any display uh, application, and that is 
the pixel to pixel you call me. Mm -hmm. In your case, in, a, in the LED, again, the LED, micro LED, it's all current driven. So your IV characteristic curve has to be identical mm -hmm. from one corner to another corner, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So they currently in the Samsung phone, they have seven transistors to take care of that problem. Uh, one oh, uh, capacitor, seven transistors. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, just to take care of the the the, the non-uniformity of transistors and ensure the current output, the light output proportional to current output at wide current density or uh, current range. Mm -hmm. So in let's say you look at this one here, you have ten or twelve here. Mm -hmm. What is the you the the IV rotation? You know, we're, we're not a good example because we're, we're, we're two inch reactor, but I can tell you in, in industry, they're on six inch uh, sapphire now, again, very good uniformity, but by very good, I mean plus or minus two nanometer, no, plus or minus one nanometer, two nanometer flow range, and the voltage is plus or minus three KT, so that's 75 MeV for the IV curves now. I'm not sure if that's good enough. I'm not sure I don't, I don't know, like it. Uh, we call it the neural problem. Mm -hmm. MURA. Okay. Right. I did not have to look up. So, so that is a visual problem that uh, is annoying to the eye if you have uh, random variations and then the, the, the picture quality would, would be poor. And then another issue with the LED is that if you look at any billboard today, mm -hmm. there's no billboard that I have seen that has no defect. Like Oh, I zero. <laughs> I mean, anywhere in Times Square and Beijing, Hong Kong, Shanghai, mm -hmm. the newest one, the oldest one, uh, even the traffic light in New York City, every one of them has defects. On. <laughs> I've seen traffic lights without defects, but I've seen lots of lots defects. Of, yeah, yeah, lots. So I think the reliability of the LED can be a problem. No, it's the electronics, not the well, LED. whatever that is. The whole it's system. System. It's the driver electronics. It's yeah. usually the driver, but. Uh, yeah. but no, his point, the uniformity I'm more worried about. I, I don't know what kind of uh, wavelength uniformity, because your eye in the green no, can see two nanometers. Uniformity. It's not the wavelength uniformity. Yeah, you're worried about the IV. Yeah, the IV. Yeah, that's a tough well, one. The, you're using different material system, like the atom gap and the Indian system has a mm -hmm. different uh, temperature sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you need active control. I mean, yeah. I also the, yeah, this pick and place things. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it worries me that uh, you know you have to pick the perfectly good ones, <laughs> and, and and somehow all the IV controls doesn't uh, remain the same uh, without you know the, this the, the too many process involved. That seems like to me. Yeah, I mean, and they have to be cheap. Uh, like I said, a lot of people want to do massive testing. So in other words, they don't. You don't test each other. You do like a take a camera shot of uh, a million pixels at once, and then somehow sort from that. Uh, but like I said, some people think it's an engineering problem. I think it's a scientific problem for this uh, for gallium nitride. This is why I'm very worried about the red. The, yeah. Yeah. Red's a like Kimmy said, different temperature. So the displays you got to readjust the red depending on the temperature. Really? Oh, red's yeah, very temperature yeah, sensitive. Yeah. Uh, Fifty percent drops uh, from twenty-five C to hundred C. Okay, we'll send the speaker again and. Uh